Okay, so uh, moving on to chapter 14. Uh, let's do a nice little summary of uh, this particular thing for the standard level 12th graders. Uh, and this one is uh, just a, a few more special uh, derivative rules. Um, this particular section is not as hard as the next one where we get into uh, integration and stuff like that. But uh, the word problems here are actually really, really good. So it's definitely worth uh, covering right now. So uh, for this one, we just have to go over, um, it looks like just three basic things, the chain rule, the product rule, and uh, the quotient rule. And uh, I believe that's it. I mean, I'll, I'll, look, I'll flip through here, but I'm just looking off of the chapter summary on page 437 here. Um, all right, so the chain rule, uh, it's written down like this. So if you have uh, dy over dx, that's the same thing as saying dy over du times du over dx. Um, and the way that I read it is you take the, uh, the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. Okay, and we'll, we'll do a couple of examples here. So uh, for example, if I have, uh, if I have x squared plus 5 cubed, something like that, and I want to find out what the derivative of this thing is, well, I could just use the chain rule. So I treat this like the outside here, and I take the derivative of that, which means that uh, the 3 comes down and the 3 becomes a 2, so I'll have 3, and then I just copy down the middle part here, but then I have to multiply it by the derivative of the inside, which in this case is just 2x. And I can clean this up, of course, but uh, you get the general idea. The chain rule is uh, pretty straightforward, but um, it, it's new uh, for some of you viewers out there. Uh, but I, I felt like this one wasn't uh, too bad. It, it wasn't tedious or anything. Okay, uh, the next two are uh, fairly straightforward. We have the product rule and the quotient rule. So um, I like to represent these with u and v. It's a little easier to remember. Uh, if you're trying to find uh, the derivative of u times v, well, that will be the derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. So it's going to be u prime v plus u v prime. And that's it. That's the entire product rule in a nutshell right there. And you notice it's like uv, uv, uv. It's, it's easier to remember uh, when you have it in a format that you can easily recall. Um, so that's, that's pretty straightforward. And we'll do a few examples of uh, how to use the product rule, but uh, you know, it's just a formula. It's not too bad. Uh, the other one is the quotient rule. So if you have u over v and you wanna take the uh, derivative of that, well, you have to take the derivative of the top times the bottom minus the derivative of the bottom times the top all over the bottom squared. So with this one, it's going to be u prime v minus u v prime. Notice it looks a lot like the product rule, except there's a minus sign here, all over the bottom squared. And uh, that's basically it. Um, now, uh, that, that that's the entirety of chapter 14, more or less. Um, but the, the trick here is that you have to actually apply these rules in a creative way uh, in order to get uh, the desired result. Uh, with that, why don't we do a couple of really, really tough problems here and uh, mix with a couple of easy problems here. All right, now uh, this problem right here uh, I thought was uh, really, really good. Uh, it was pointed out to me by uh, another teacher here um, and uh, ultimately it was decided that this might be aiming really, really high for uh, our 12th graders here. Um, still though, it, it's a fun problem and it's definitely worth um, absorbing anyway. Um, I'm looking at uh, page 436, number five, <clears throat> if you will. Uh, and it says that a rectangle is drawn inside the region bounded by the curve, uh, y is equal to sine of x. Um, and you can see the figure in your book here, but uh, let me just hold it up for the camera here. Uh, it's right where my finger is right here. Okay, so you got a rectangle. It's drawn inside the uh, first part of the uh, sine wave here. 
Okay. And uh, it's bounded by the curve y is equal to sine of x. You know, so uh, so it's bounded by y, y is equal to sine of x and the x-axis. Okay. Um, and the vertex A has the coordinates x0. So A is basically going to be x0, meaning uh, unlike the picture, uh, A is actually on the x-axis because it has a y value of 0. So don't be misled by that a whole bunch. All right, so uh, write down the coordinates of point B. This would be AI. Well, um, if you're following along from the book, uh, what would be the coordinates of B? Well, recall that uh, uh, half of a wave, the, the entire length of uh, the wave here, this thing, from uh, 0 to pi. That, so this whole wave here is going to be from 0 to pi, and that means if this is x, this has to be pi minus x. This is just... Uh, knowing your um tr you know your sine waves and stuff so that that seems pretty straightforward that means that the coordinates of b uh <laughs> this is probably the easiest part of the entire problem is just pi minus x zero okay now a2 says uh find an expression for the area of the rectangle in terms of x okay um why don't we actually get our sketch here going here okay so I've got uh, X and I've got pi minus X here okay I need to know what this width is here and I need to know what this height is here because the area of a rectangle is uh, you know height times width or length times width whatever um, all right why don't we handle this one first so I'm gonna take pi minus x and uh, subtract x from that and that'll be the width of the rectangle here so um, my width is just going to be pi minus x which is the big distance minus x so my width is going to be pi minus 2x okay now what would be the height of this rectangle here well I uh, I mean if this is x and this wave is sine of x well, then that means that the height here has to be sine of x, okay? So that means that the area of this uh, rectangle has to be sine of x times pi minus 2x. And that's the answer to A2. Uh, I'll clean this up with the, the power of movie magic here. Okay, so um, I just rewrote the equation up here on top for the area of this cool rectangle. Uh, 5b says, show that the rectangle has a maximum area when uh, 2 tangent of x is equal to pi minus 2x. Uh, basically, I have to find the, um, the maximum area here. How do I do that? Well, you take the derivative and set it equal to 0. We're basically having to find a stationary point here. And uh, we're going to take the derivative of a with respect to x, looks like. Okay, well, that means that uh, a prime, well, it looks like, uh, looks like I could just do the uh, product rule, right? Um, I mean, I, I, could, I could distribute this and stuff, but that's extra work. Why would I do that? So I'll take the derivative of the first times the second. Well, the derivative of sine, recall, is cosine. So the first... Uh, term here is just going to be that. All right, now remember I have to add the derivative of the second times the first. Well, the second part here is just this entire little piece right here. Um, so why don't I just go ahead and just copy down the first part first here really fast. And what's the derivative of pi minus 2x? Well, the derivative of pi, pi is just a number. So pi just turns into, you know, zero. And uh, the derivative of negative 2x is just negative 2. So I'm going to write negative 2 right here. Okay, and uh, if I'm trying to find the maximum area here, I have to set the derivative, this entire 
sum, I have to set this whole thing equal to zero. Okay, pretty easy. Uh, now it looks like they want me to uh, get this in terms of tangent. So uh, how about I rewrite this a little bit so I can actually see what's going on, you know what I'm saying? So how about uh, minus two sine of x, I hope you all can see that, uh, plus cosine of x pi minus 2x is equal to 0. So if it wants it in terms of tangent, uh, tangent is sine over cosine. Since I have a sine right here, I could just divide everything by cosine. All right, so how about I divide this by cosine of x, I divide this by cosine of x, and then I divide 0 by cosine of x, which just turns into 0, you know what I mean? I apologize for running out of room. This is my $10 target board. All right, so negative 2, well, sine or sine over cosine just turns into tangent. So this just turns into minus 2 tangent of x. Uh, these cosines actually cancel out, so I'll be left with pi minus 2x, and 0 over cosine is just 0. Super. Uh, now, in order to actually show that the rectangle has a maximum area, blah, 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 when you have, you know, minus 2 tangent of x, I just add it to both sides. So, in the end, yeah, I, I actually show that it's true. When 2 tangent of x equals pi minus 2x, we get a maximum area. Nice. Super duper. Uh, and now... Uh, 5c says find the maximum possible area of the rectangle and you'll notice that there's a little calculator symbol here that's because you actually need to solve this uh, graphically uh, and in order to do this graphically um, I'm gonna pretend like I have a TI-84 um, I obviously don't I'm gonna use Mathematica for that but uh, you'll notice that with this equation here they want you to figure out what x value this is you can't do this analytically. You have to do it um, uh, graphically, or you have to do some kind of approximation here. Um, so here I have uh, 2 tangent of x. I'm just copying it down here. And I got pi minus 2x. All right. Now, the way to do this with your uh, TI-84 is uh, get everything over onto one side. Okay, so let's say I have, uh, you know, 2 tangent of x minus pi plus 2x, and of course this equals 0. Now all I need to do is type this into my calculator and uh, find out when does it actually cross the x-axis, like when do I get a 0. To do that you go to your graph, you say calculate the 0, you'll need a left bound and a right bound and a guess. Uh, me, I'm going to use Mathematica, so uh, hang on just a second here. I'm going to be doing this via Mathematica here, and uh, you all will need to actually do this through your graphing calculators. Um, so uh, you have to graph it. Um, you have to go to calc and zero. Uh, all right, and then for that you're going to need a left bound and a right bound and a guess. All right. And then it'll tell you uh, some kind of decimal answer. Me, I don't have that, so I'm actually just going to use the command that will do it, which is called to find the root. A root is just where does it actually cross the x-axis. Um, and uh, I tried doing this with uh, n solve, uh, but apparently this this was actually too complicated. <laughs> it was trying to use a different method. This one's actually going to do it graphically, which is pretty much the only way to do this particular thing. So let's go 2 times tangent of x, I'm just typing in the thing we had, minus pi plus 2 times x, and uh, the variable we're looking for is x, and it tells you what's the first root you want to use. Well, um, it's going to start at 0 and find the first root from 0 moving to the right. And our answer is that, 0.710. Um, okay. So that means that uh, when x is 0 0.7105, I guess, then we have a maximum area of the rectangle, okay? 
Now, while we're here, uh, let's actually find the uh, maximum area of the rectangle. So why don't we actually copy this down so that way I can keep using it over and over. Well, that would mean, uh, remember that the, uh, the area, the original formula, was uh, sine of uh, x times uh, pi minus 2 times x, right? Um, so I'm actually just going to uh, delete the x and just put this uh, big value in here. I just copied and pasted the answer that we had before. And this is the formula for the area of a rectangle. I hit enter, and it looks like the maximum area that this rectangle can have is 1.122. And that's the answer to number five. Pretty easy, right? <clears throat> um, you know, I'm just kind of like looking for hard problems to do out of this chapter. And um, just scrolling down here, I see one still on page 436. Uh, number eight. That looks pretty tough. Why don't we try that out? So uh, number eight on page 40, 436 says the sum of two numbers, x and y, is six. Why don't I jot that down? So x plus y is equal to six. And importantly, it says that x and y are both non-negative. So they're both greater than or equal to zero. Find the two numbers, x and y, um, if the sum of their squares is one, the minimum possible, and the next one is the maximum possible. Uh, okay, so uh, why don't I actually do that here? So the sum of their squares is the minimum possible. Well, the sum of their squares would be x squared plus y squared is equal to uh, something. I don't know. Why don't we call it uh, s? You know, we, we don't know what, what that sum is, but uh, maybe we want to find out uh, what the two numbers are uh, depending on what S is. Um, all right, so if I want to maximize the sum of these squares, I need to take the derivative of S with respect to, I guess, X or something, and then solve for, uh, set it equal to zero, solve for X, and once I know X, I can figure out what Y is. Uh, but first of all, I can't actually do the derivative directly here. I need to write, I guess, one of these in terms of the other. Um, that seems pretty straightforward, right? So why don't I actually give myself a little room here. So uh, if x plus y is equal to 6, well, then that means that y has to equal 6 minus x. Nice. So that means that if I have uh, x squared plus y squared, this just turns into, you know, x squared plus 6 minus x squared. All right. Now, uh, while I'm here, how about I just take the uh, derivative of this and uh, move on with life? So uh, the derivative here is just going to be, well, this turns into 2x. And uh, rather than foil this whole thing out, let's do the chain rule. I think that's a lot easier here, right? So let's bring this 2 down. And that 2 becomes a 1, so I'll have 2 times 6 minus x. But then I have to multiply this by the derivative of the inside, which this 6 turns into 0, this negative x turns into a negative 1. So really, I could just do this, minus. Nice. Pretty easy. Uh, and then I just set this thing equal to 0 and uh, solve for x. That seems pretty, uh, pretty clear. Uh, right, so I'll have a 2x minus 12 plus 2x is equal to 0. I add 12 to both sides, and I can combine these into a 4x is equal to 12. This implies that x is equal to 3. All right, but if x is equal to 3, then y, of course, has to equal 3 as well. And uh, that's one answer. Looks looks pretty good, honestly. So uh, this one I would actually count as the uh, maximum area here, uh, if you think about it, you know. Um, and this just comes from experience. Anytime that you are trying to, you know, maximize a sum here like that, uh, you're going to see some kind of symmetry here. Um, whatever. Why don't we actually why don't we actually log this so. This is either a maximum 
or a minimum here, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, this is definitely a, a, a maximum here. How, how do we know? You know, how do we know? Um, why don't we actually test that to see how do we know? You know what I mean? All right, well, uh, coming back to it, uh, I actually worked it out a little bit in advance and I think I misspoke. Uh, that 3-3 three, three thing, it's not a maximum actually. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let's actually see why, okay? So um, this is S, right? Um, S prime, recall, was uh, 2x, and then you have um, this 2 comes down, so you'll have 2 times 6 minus x, and then the derivative of the inside is minus 1, so this just becomes a minus thing. You can redistribute it here, and you'll have s prime is equal to 4x minus 12. s double prime, in this particular case, is going to be 4, which is greater than 0. So that means if I were to plug in that value, uh, x is equal to, uh, you know, 3, or whatever, it doesn't matter. I, I can't actually put it in here. I'm actually going to get a positive value, meaning that pretty much at all points uh, from negative infinity to positive infinity, we're always trying to be going up. You know, we're always trying to increase. Uh, we're always trying to get away from the black hole, meaning that that stationary point, even that one has like an upward thrust, meaning we are actually trying to get away from the black hole. We have upward thrust, that value right there, x is equal to 3 and y is equal to 3, that's actually a minimum. Cool, right? Uh, and we can verify that by just plugging it in here. Um, all right, well, if this is a minimum, well, then you have to wonder what would a maximum be because that's, uh, that's what letter B is looking for here. So the minimum here, of course, is going to be uh, 3 and 3. Um, what would the maximum possible thing uh, have to be? Well, uh, this is a uh, parabola, if you will, and it looks like the, uh, the bigger my x value is, you know, the bigger my sum is going to be. All right, so all I need to do is just pick the biggest x value here as I'm moving to the right, and uh, then I'll have the biggest uh, sum, you know what I mean? Uh, let, let me actually illustrate this a little bit more clearly here. So at all points, my uh, double derivative, my s double prime, is positive. So that stationary point is actually going to be a minimum right down here. Uh, what would the maximum be? Well, remember that uh, x and y are non-negative, and x plus y uh, has to be equal to 6. Meaning that if I set y equal to 0, x would actually equal 6 in this particular case. Okay. Um, and uh, let me actually make this look a little bit more like a parabola. So if you FOIL this whole thing out, you'll actually get 2x squared minus 12x um, plus 36. All right. Which means, since this is a positive number here, and it's it's obviously a parabola, all I need to do is like, all right, you know, blah, 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 blah. It looks like the minimum value happens when x is equal to 3, remember? So you're going to have this particular thing right here. So the minimum value is going to be right here. Meaning this sum, the y value here, is only going to get bigger and bigger as I move to the right or the left here. Uh, so when x is equal to 6 or when y is equal to... Uh, or, or when x is equal to zero, then y will equal six, then I'll get my maximum area, okay? Um, right, so uh, the only other option here to get a maximum area here is going to be when x is equal to zero and y is equal to six or vice versa. So the maximum is actually going to be when x is equal to six and y is equal to zero. And uh, that would be your answer right there. I know that that seemed a little too confusing and whatever, but uh, uh, it, it turns out that because f double prime is always positive, we're always going to be looping upward, which means that that stationary point also has a positive 
a double derivative, which makes this stationary point technically a minimum. In which case, if you're going to go looking for a maximum, you have to start looking like, well, within the domain, what would the maximum points be? It would actually be these extreme endpoints of the domain. Um, so that's really the, the big trick out of number eight. Pretty fun. Okay, why don't we do a few easy ones now? I feel like we, uh, we owe it to ourselves to do at least a couple of easy ones. Um, here I'm in the chapter review, uh, page 440, and I'm on number two. It says, uh, find dy, dx, if a, b, and c. So the first one says, all right, uh, a, uh, I'm going to have y is equal to e to the 5x. Well, I'm, I need to find out what y prime is. Well, um, it's just going to be the chain rule here, right? So I got to say, all right, this is the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside, where the inside here is actually 5x. Well, the derivative of the outside is just e to the x power. That's a, that's a special derivative where it's actually equal to itself. So I'm actually going to get e to the 5x. But then I have to multiply it by the derivative of the inside. Well, the derivative of 5x is just 5. And that's it. Easy peasy. Why don't we do b? All right, so this one says uh, y is equal to the square root of 3x plus 2. Why don't I rewrite this in a calculus-friendly format where I make the square root to the 1 half power? So I'll make this uh, 3x plus 2 to the 1 half power. I know it's kind of hard to see what I did there. So now y prime, well, it looks like I just do the chain rule again. This 1 half comes down, and then it turns into a minus 1. So I'll get uh, 1 half 3x plus 2 to the minus 1 half. But then I have to multiply this whole thing by the derivative of the inside. Well, the derivative of 3x is just 3. The derivative of 2 is just 0. So I just got to multiply this whole thing by 3. How about I just put that right there? Make it easy. Piece of cake. Uh, finally, we've got the uh, letter C here. So why don't I give myself a little room here? Letter C, uh, that looks pretty promising here. How about we got E, can you read that? Uh, e to the five X and then uh, square root of three X plus two. Once again, I'm gonna rewrite this in a calculus friendly format here because those radicals really drive me nuts. So for this one, we're going to have to do uh, two different rules at the same time. I need to do the chain rule and the chain rule, and I need to do the product rule. So here we're actually combining two different rules. So why don't we do the, the derivative of the first times the second? Well, the derivative of the first, recall, is the chain rule. So it's going to be 5e to the 5x times, and then you just copy the second part down, 3x plus 2 to the 1 half power. Okay, then you have to add the derivative of the second times the first. Well, the first we can just carry along for the ride. The derivative of the second, we already did that. The one half comes down and turns into a minus one half. And then you got to multiply it by the derivative of three X plus two, which is just three. So I could just do this three over two, three X plus two to the minus one half power. And that's it. I mean, you can, you can simplify this whole sum if you want. You can factor the e to the 5x out. You can, um, you know, you can combine it if you want. That's totally fine. But for our purposes here, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. That's the entire uh, product rule right there. Easy peasy. Okay, so I'm um, just kind of looking through here. Let's try to find a nice tough one here. Um, number four looks like a pretty typical problem that IB would put on an exam. It even says IB organization 2005, which means that this problem is so good that it is still relevant to this day. Um, so why don't we actually do it? So 440, number four. Okay, so the diagram shows a rectangular area A, B, C, D bounded on three sides by 60 meters of fencing and the fourth wall 
and the fourth by a wall AB. Why don't we actually sketch the situation right here? Okay, uh huh. So I got A and B, uh, C, D, and um, it looks like it's bounded on uh, the total length here. It's 60 meters of fencing. So when you are trying to fence something, you it, it actually comes in a roll and it measures out how much fencing that you want. Okay, so the total length from here to here to here, it all adds up to 60 is what it's saying. Find the width of the rectangle, that is the length um, AD, so it, it wants this thing right here, we'll call that X, uh, that gives its maximum area. So we gotta maximize the uh, area here, and we need to know what this thing is. Um, okay, well first of all, it tells us that it's a rectangle, okay? So that means that the opposite side has to also be the same um, length as this one. So uh, now we just need to know what this length is right here. Once we can, once we do that, then we're, we're good to go. Uh, let's call that Y. I don't know what that is yet. Well, uh, we do know that X plus X plus Y adds up to 60 because it's 60 meters of fencing. So that means X plus X plus Y is equal to 60. Uh, let's try to get y by itself here. So that means y is equal to 60 minus 2x. Hey, I I've written y in terms of x. That's good. That's going to be handy for when I want to do my derivative. So that means that this whole thing right here just turns into 60 minus 2x. Sick. All right. We're, we're in business now. Okay. Now we want to maximize our area. And uh, for that... I need to first have the formula for the area. Well, the formula for the area of any rectangle here is uh, length times width. So that means that area is just going to be x times 60 minus 2x. Nice. Super duper. Um, you know, I, I feel like uh, I could just distribute that. that. That's so easy. Why don't I just go ahead and do that? So 60x minus 2x squared. Cool. All right, so how about, all right, now I need to maximize the area. Well, anytime that you hear the word maximize or minimize, you immediately want to think, I better take the derivative and set it equal to zero. So why don't I take the derivative of A with respect to X, and I'm going to set this thing equal to zero. Well, the derivative of 60X is just 60, and the derivative of minus 2X squared, well, the 2 comes down, and then I'll get minus 4 x and I have to set this whole thing equal to zero and solve for x and that's actually the entire problem right there so if I add 4x to this side and then divide by 4 I'm actually going to get uh, x is equal to 15 and uh, that's it that's pretty much the entire thing I mean if you want to verify that it is a maximum well I could say alright well a double prime here so the 60 goes away and this negative 4x turns into a minus 4. So that means that at all points, a double prime means I'm trying to get away from the sun. I'm trying to blast my way downward, meaning it's doing this. I am trying to go down, 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 down. So this path actually traces a mountain peak, meaning this stationary point also has a double derivative that's less than 0, meaning it's actually a local maximum. So this one actually turns in to, to gets you uh, the maximum area for uh, your fencing. Pretty easy. All right, this next one is worth 17 points, and there's only four parts to it. Uh, this one looks pretty good, and I'm not allowed to use a calculator for this one. Uh, whew, that's going to be interesting. Uh, let, let's see what we can do with that one. All right, so a curve has this uh, cool equation right here. I've got y is equal to uh, x squared over 1 minus 2x. All right, write down the equation of the vertical asymptote of the curve. Well, an asymptote, recall, is a value that um, the curve approaches but never quite touches. You know what I mean? So you have to ask yourself, what is x not allowed to equal? 
Well, if you look, I'm never allowed to divide by zero. You know that? That's a cardinal rule for all of math. So that means this thing cannot equal zero. So let's just see. So negative 2x, you know, 1 minus 2x, if I were to, what, what x value would actually make that equal to zero? Well, x would actually have to be 1 half. That would be the equation for the one vertical asymptote of this curve. So uh, that's easy peasy. Uh, let's do another one here. So B says, use differentiation to find the coordinates of stationary points on the curve. Um, okay, well, uh, that's pretty easy. So all I got to do now is uh, I have to find the stationary points, which means what x values will give me a y prime equal to zero. Okay, well, first of all, let's actually find out what y prime is. Well, y prime is, uh, all right, I have to use the quotient rule again. Okay, so uh, let's see, x, uh, so the derivative of the top times the bottom. Well, the derivative of x squared is just 2x, so I'm going to get 2x, and then I multiply it by my, uh, I got a burrito, the entire thing on the bottom, okay? Minus the derivative of the bottom times the top. Well, the derivative of the bottom is, well, this turns into zero, and this turns into minus two, uh, so really I could just change that to a plus two and then I just copy down the top so x squared all over the bottom squared and I have to set this whole thing equal to zero looks like I'm angling downward uh, I'm very sorry about that because uh, I'm at a very weird angle with this board um, anyway uh, now I just got to solve for x and uh, then I'm done well, recall that uh, x, we already know x does not equal, uh, you know, one half. You know, this is a vertical asymptote. So we're, we know that x will never equal one half. So that means that this is not equal to zero. I can actually cross multiply this and, you know, I can actually just figure out what is the top equal to zero. And then I'm, I'm actually good to go there. So let's try it. So that means I'm gonna have 2x, one minus 2x plus 2x squared is equal to zero. Yep, I cross multiply that. Anything times zero is just zero. Nice. Uh, so let's actually you know, distribute this. I'm gonna have a 2x minus 4x squared plus 2x squared is equal to zero. Um, and I can combine these and I'll get uh, 2x minus 2x squared is equal to zero. I can divide everything by two and I'll get x minus x squared is equal to zero. And then I can factor out the x, uh, x one minus x is equal to zero. All right, so I actually have two stationary points, one where x is equal to zero and one where x is equal to one. Those are my two possible stationary points. Uh, and that's letter B. All right, now we know why this is worth 17 points. It's because it's tedious and takes a long time. Uh, that's because 2C, it starts getting pretty real. Um, so it says determine the nature of the stationary points. I actually just copied down y prime the way we had it before, and our stationary points are 0 and 1, recall. Well, in order to find out the nature of the stationary points, I need to take the derivative of the derivative. This thing is kind of a beast. Let's actually simplify it before we try to take the derivative directly. Um, so y prime, if we clean this up quite a lot, let's see, let's distribute the 2x here. We'll have 2x minus 4x squared plus 2x squared all over 1 minus 2x squared. Let's uh, factor out a 2. We can combine all these x's and factor them out a little bit. And we'll have y prime is equal to uh, 2 times x times 1 minus x all over 1 minus 2x squared. So I factored out a, a 2 here, and I factored out an x from uh, after combining these two things right here. Uh, no big deal. You can verify that this is absolutely right. Now, through the power of movie magic, we're going to rewrite this up here and find y double prime. Ah. 
Okay, so I just copied down this equation that was down here up to here. And now I need to find out what y double prime is of this. I got to use the quotient rule. Uh, and this top part's really annoying me. I don't really like dealing with this thing. So looking at it now, I think it's a lot easier to just write this as x squared uh, uh, x minus x squared. You know, it's a lot easier to just write it like that. Okay. Y double prime, let's do this really fast. So the two comes out front, the derivative of the top times the bottom, you'll get uh, one minus two X, that's times one minus two X squared. That means I have three one minus two X's. So one minus two X cubed. Minus, all right, the derivative of the bottom times the top. Well, that means this two comes down and I'll have one minus two X like that. And I got to multiply it by the top. Oh, but I have to multiply it by the derivative of the inside. The derivative of the inside is just minus 2. So minus 2 times minus 2. This thing actually just turns into plus 4. And I'm running out of room right here. And I got to multiply the derivative of the bottom times the top. So I'll actually get x minus x squared right here. Ugh, that's what I was afraid of. I had to squeeze it in a little bit. This is x minus x squared. Uh, all over the bottom squared. And 1 minus 2x squared squared turns this into the fourth power. Okay, so the question is, what is x equal to 0 and what is x equal to 1? Is this a maximum or a minimum? To do this, I just plug in 0 and see if it's positive or negative or neither. Okay, let's see what we get. So y double prime of 0 all right, well, this 2 comes along for the ride. Let's plug in zeros everywhere. Everywhere we see an x, we're going to put a 0. All right, 1 minus 0. So this is 1 cubed. That turns into 1. Plus 4 times, all right, 1 minus 0. So that's just 1. And 0 minus 0, that's 0. Okay? And then 1 minus 0 is 1 to the 4th power. 1 to the 4th power is just 1. So this whole thing is now going to be 1 plus 0. This thing just goes away. 2 times 1 over 1. So this thing is actually all equal to 2, which is greater than 0. What does that mean? That means that, uh, well, I'm trying to accelerate upwards, meaning I'm trying to get away from the black hole. I'm accelerating upwards. I actually form a little bit of a minimum here. So in this case, x equals 0 actually makes a minimum right? Because y double prime, you plug in a zero, it's greater than zero, which means it's going to carve out a minimum. Now, what happens when we do y double prime of one? Well, the two comes along for the ride. Uh, let's see, one minus two times one, that's one minus two, that's negative one. And negative one cubed gives you negative one times negative one times negative one. So you're going to get a minus one because when you have an odd number of negatives you're going to have a negative number okay so that's this part plus four times all right one minus two is negative one and then one minus one is zero all over one minus two this is negative one to the fourth power now I have an even number of negatives negative one times negative one times negative one times negative one that's four negatives, I'm actually going to get a positive number on the bottom. All right, so zero times anything, this whole thing turns into a zero here. So we could just kind of erase this thing. And I'm going to get two times negative one over one. This whole thing actually turns into negative two, and this is less than a zero. So what does that mean? It means I'm trying to uh, go down. I'm trying to get away from the sun. So now I'm doing this. Ah, get away from the sun, 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 get away from the sun. It actually makes a little bit of a mountain peak, which means that with x is equal to 1, you're going to get a maximum. Okay? Now, uh, combining all that with the, the idea that we got a vertical asymptote at x is equal to 1 half, that's actually going to lead us straight into the next section uh, quite easily. Okay, now for the hardest part of this entire question, which says, sketch the graph, uh, knowing all this stuff, 
with y is equal to x squared over uh, 1 minus 2x. Uh, yeah, this one is going to be kind of interesting here. All right. Uh, in order to really understand this particular uh, problem, uh, it, it would be nice to have a basic shape going into this problem. Um, but it's not really clear. It doesn't really follow any basic shapes that we know of. However, we do know that there's a minimum at x is equal to 0, there's a maximum at x is equal to 1, and we know it can't touch 1 half. All right, so let's actually start with uh, this thing right here. So let's call this um, 0, let's call this 1, and let's call this 1 half. All right. So that means that uh, this forms a minimum here. So we know, and, and it, it's going to actually approach a vertical asymptote of one half. So we know that it's gonna look a little bit like that, okay? Something like that. And uh, at x equal to one, it's gonna have some type of a maximum. Now, we don't know if this is like above the x-axis or below the x-axis. I mean, I suppose I could well, actually, no, if I plug in zero here, this whole thing actually turns into zero, uh, right? Because if I plug in zero here, this turns into zero, this bottom one turns into one. So actually, this is going to touch at one. And then uh, it has to like angle upward somewhere over here, okay? Now, uh, what happens if x is equal to one? Well, I'm going to have a one on top and then one minus two uh, times one. So this actually turns into negative one. Uh, so one over negative one actually turns into negative one. So actually the height when X is equal to one, it's actually going to hit this part right here. So that'll be my local maximum right there. So that means this is my vertical asymptote right here. It's going to hit a maximum here. And since that is a maximum, that means that way over here, it's going to have to angle downward a little bit. Uh, and that's it. Actually, that that's not bad. Um, yeah, so let, let's actually review this one more time. Um, X is equal to zero makes a minimum, and if I plug in zero here to find out what the height is, well, I have a zero on top and some non-negative, some non-zero number on the bottom. So actually, this turns into zero. And since this forms a minimum, that means that uh, the, on the right and on the left, they both have to go up a little bit. So this has to go up and this has to go up. And uh, since this, these are the only two stationary points, we know that this is not going to dip back down anytime soon. It's not going to dip back down because if it did, that would be another stationary point and we didn't find that. So that means this is going to actually go up forever in this direction right here. And going up this way, it's going to approach one half but never quite touch one half. And for similar reasons right here, if you plug in an x is equal to one here, well, you'll have one squared, which is one, one minus two times one. So this bottom part turns into a negative one. One over negative one actually makes it equal to a height of negative one. So that means that, uh, actually that's pretty bad. This is supposed to be negative one, not, not that. Ooh, I really can't sketch on a dry erase board. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> this one could be a negative one right here. When you plug in an X value equal to one, we know it's a local maximum. So that means it's not going, it has to form some type of peak here. Going to the left, it's going to approach one half, but never quite touch one half. And since this is a maximum, it means everything to the right is going to have to angle downward here. And if you were to check this on your graphing calculator, you're going to get something that looks roughly like that. Okay, and that's the answer to 2D. Pretty cool, right? All right, so um, that basically covers some tougher problems and some easier problems out of uh, chapter 14. Most of them are pretty hard, I admit, but uh, that's because within those really tough problems, we showed examples of how to do the easy problems, like the chain rule, the product rule, the quotient rule, and how to maximize certain word problems and stuff. If you wanna maximize any kind of weird situation analytically, you gotta take the derivative, set it equal to zero. If you want to find out if it's a maximum or a minimum, remember you have to take uh, F double prime and you got to see when I plug in my X value, do I get a positive value or a negative value? And does that actually make a mountain peak or a uh, mountain valley? Okay. 
Uh, right. So this one was actually not too bad. Uh, if you uh, think about it. The next chapter, uh, which is the last part of the uh, calculus section for the uh, standard level, that's when things get very interesting, when we start dealing with integrals and all the weird tricks that you're going to encounter. So uh, take care, look for my next video, and uh, wash your hands and stay safe. Take care.